Welcome on this Monday of Holy Week. Yesterday we started Holy Week with our celebration of the Mass of the Lord's Passion. So I do hope that this is a grace-filled time for you, uh, for your families. And as we begin our Holy Week reflections, I begin today reflecting on silence and waiting. That seems appropriate uh, for this time of shelter in place the, with the stay-at-home order. Well, actually, there's probably not much silence, but there might be some waiting if, you're, if some of your daily activities are no longer there. So, uh, starting with waiting. We are waiting for God to act. There's a limit to what we can do by our own power. We're waiting for God to act because there are some things that we can't do for ourselves. You know, we see this most poignantly with death. And we we hear about death on the news. You know, we know the death of our loved ones. With death, we see in the the most poignant example that there is a limit to our efforts. 13, it was 13 years ago that my dad died. And since then, I, I haven't been together with my dad in the flesh. You know, in, um, one, one of my grandpas died, one grandpa died in 1997, the other in 2000. And so, yeah, I can, I can see pictures, I can hear stories. That's wonderful to hear stories. I, I can, uh, maybe I can see videos. But I can't hear my grandpa laugh, not really laugh. Videos just don't capture that. And so if we look to ourselves and not to God, when a loved one dies, it would seem that death wins. When life and death contend, which will win? We are waiting for God to act. But there's a limit to what we can do by our own power. Our ingenuity, our technology, our efforts to figure things out, they're good. You know, God's given this great gift to understand our world around us, to make life better for others. And I'm, we're, we're praying for the doctors, the, 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 the scientists who are working on vaccines for cures. Those are beautiful things, but there's a limit to what we can do. There's a limit to our strength and energy. There's a limit to our life. We were reminded of this at the beginning of Lent when the ashes were placed on our forehead and sometimes we hear those words, you are death and to death, you are dust and to dust you shall return. There's a limit to what we can do by our own efforts. And so we're waiting for God to act. That's what we're looking for during this time, this, uh, this Holy Week and the events that we commemorate at the end of Holy Week. You know, I think it's uh, important to remind you here what God's plan is. If we're waiting for God to act, what's his plan? What's he up to? So I need to say something about how God's work as a father is different from the work of our earthly parents. You know, a mother and a father have done their job well when their child doesn't need them anymore. And that's a bit of an overstatement. It's a bit of an overstatement. You know, I mean, there's, you look for affection or affirmation. You look for wisdom in your parents as you respect them in every age of your life. But there's that basic idea that if the parents have done their job well, their child grows up to be an adult, a responsible adult, they can care for things themselves. The parents are raising their human child to live a human life. And as such, that human child has the capacity for a human life. He needs development, time for development, for for the body, for the faculties of the mind, and it needs training. But the the earthly parents are preparing a human child for a human life. And this is where things are a little different with God. Because our Father in heaven, his plan is for us to share in his divine life. His plan is to raise us to divine life. And that we can't do on our own. That is why we're waiting for God to act. You know, what what I mean by divine life, I'll try to touch on it in this way, glimpse it this way, but you can never really, really, really say about it. I mean, 
This is just a for instance about human life and just in, in a, a limited misunderstanding of human life. I know that many of you are mature. You, you've learned, you've grown in the faith and this, it hasn't been how you've approached it. But one approach to human life might be, well, you know, I'm going to work hard and when I get that, 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 that stellar car, then I'll truly be living. You get the car and then you think, well, when I get a boat, then I'll be truly living. You get the boat. And then you think, you know, when I get a bigger house or, you know, this certain type of house, then I'll be truly living. Well, when does it stop? Is there an end? Is there a place that we want to arrive at? Where does it end? But then in our, in our life, we know other times. The other times when, where we might glimpse something of this divine life that God wants us to share. And it's just a glimpse. You know, there might be times when you're in the company of good friends. And it seems like time stands still. Or times when you're in the woods or you're on the hilltop or you're beside the water. Or just times when you feel somehow warm. You know, there's times in your life when there's something, there's a different quality around it. That in those times, you feel a great mix of things. You feel gratitude. You feel smallness. You feel the presence of something big or profound. You feel, you might feel somehow warm in the company of good friends or when you look out from the mountaintop and it's beautiful or you see the sun set over the water. In the reflection, there's something there. Gratitude, smallness. You're, I'm in the presence of something big. These are meant to be mere glimpses, foreshadowings of this divine life. And this would also include the best moments of married life, foreshadowings, glimpses of this divine life. You know, St. Paul could only say it this way. What eye has not seen, the ear has not heard, nor has the heart of man conceived what God has ready for those who love them. God wants to raise us to divine life. We can't do that by our own efforts. And so we're waiting for God to act. Will he act? That's what we're looking for in these events of Holy Week. And I do want to share a, a word on silence also. Silence and waiting. You know, the, the, the simplest way to think of silence is we keep silence when we want to notice something or when we want to learn something. You know, the first thing that comes to mind is a library. You have silence in a library. We want to learn something. That silence is a way of being aware of what is around us. You know, I mentioned those, those moments when you feel like you're in the presence of something big, profound. Silence helps us to recognize, notice that presence, receive that presence. And another word about silence is that silence is part of an encounter, a place of encounter. When you're in a dialogue with someone, and you know, it really stinks that I can't be in a dialogue with you. It just doesn't work right now with the, uh, with the, the, with the, uh, the shelter in place. But when you're in a dialogue with someone, you know, for it to be a true dialogue, there have to be moments of listening, that of silence. Silence is a place of encounter where there's some times in life when there just aren't words for what we want to say. You know, I heard just on the, uh, I, I heard just recently, they talked about St. Thomas Aquinas. He wrote volumes, volumes, brilliant work. And then he had an encounter of God. And he said all that was strong. All those words didn't compare to the reality. And that reality is encountered in silence. That's also why there's a silence that's appropriate to our churches. It's a way of encountering 
recognizing, noticing more fully the real presence of God with us in the Eucharist. Waiting in silence. So as you go through uh, your day today, you have some things to carry with you or that you might think on or, you know, I talk about with those who are with you in your home. And the first question is, have you ever experienced a silence that felt big or profound or deep? You know, where, where were you? When did it happen? What were the circumstances? You know, was it something that involved life and death? But have you ever experienced a profound silence? Second thing to consider is, where are the times and places that people are asked to keep silence? And that's a good question you can ask of your children too, of little children. Where are places where you're asked to keep silence? And what is it that you're trying to notice? Or what is it that you're in the present, that you're trying to encounter in those places? And then there's this beautiful account of the prophet Elijah. And so you might read 1 Kings chapter 19, verses 7 through 16. 1 Kings 9, 19 through 7, 7 through 16. And ask, what is the role of silence in that passage when God passes by Elijah? And a final thought on silence is just to recognize that within part of our Catholic heritage, part of this big universal church are the monks and nuns who live in cloister or in silence. And they remind us of silence as a place of encounter. And they also remind us as very real brothers and sisters in Christ that we, can be, that we are connected in Christ even when the normal means of connecting us have been taken away. And so you might, and you, we get a glimpse of that in a video called Into Great Silence, where it shows the life of Carthusian monks. But today, as we begin Holy Week, consider waiting in silence. We're waiting for God to act. And when we have those moments of silence, we're preparing ourselves for that encounter.